We are in Surah Al-Rum, Surah number 30. And we are in Ayah number 7. <coughs> Al-Rum, referring to the Romans. Previously we had discussed the background to the first few ayahs of the Surah. Where Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu engaged in a bet with a non-Muslim in Mecca. And then Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was uh, the winner of the bet. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave victory to the Romans over the Persians over a period of nine years. And uh, this surah was revealed to vindicate Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and expose his uh, ability to forecast and read events in the world just as Abu Bakr was given the ability to read and interpret dreams so this was the quality and sifa of Abu Bakr that he was an excellent reader of world events and of events that happen in another world known as the, the ability of ta'wil ta'wil al-ahadith ability to translate events both in the concrete world and in the abstract world as was Yusuf Islam, given this ability here now the Quran addresses human beings in totality here the address is to all human beings especially those who are representatives of civilizations the Surah Rum speaks to civilizations that as a civilization how should you see events unfolding in front of you and how do you read reality from the other world okay. so the reality now is not to be divided into what's in this world and the other world the reality is to be a whole one holistic understanding of the haq the truth whereas the truth is not limited to events in this world it may spring from another world and it may have a conclusion in another world known as the akhirah that is how you see reality the haq the absolute truth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates for a Muslim a Muslim's focus is what he does in this world but the Muslim's vision is what will happen in the other world. The Muslim's vision is not just what happens in this world. So in this world, civilizations that can think 50 years ahead and plan 100 years ahead and have treaties with people for 99 years and 100 years and you can see that other visionaries of the world who came and they were explorers and they were financiers. They saw that I have a vision. And in this vision I see in the next 30 years this is going to happen. And in the next 100 years I can see Singapore being the financial gate to the Pacific Rim. And whoever founded Singapore, the very high. And you can have treaties with China for 100 years. And you can have treaties with Panama for 100 years. This is planning future thinking, right? That's necessary part and function of government. If you don't have this, you're not a government. Period. Right? So Abu Bakr could see that this is going to happen. What? That the Romans will be victorious. But it wasn't now. It was in a few years. He said it was within nine years. That's Abu Bakr's ability. Yeah. So hence, he was the most capable from the Sahaba to do what? Be the government. That is our freedom. And so on. Omar could see what's going to happen to the land of the Fadak, which he refused to distribute as part of Ghanima and Buti. He said, no, this is for future generations. What's going to happen to the Ummah 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 40 years from now? So he refused to distribute it, distribute the land and say, no, this is for future generations. And so, on. so in a leader, you need foresight. But in a leader, you also need insight. So foresight is visionary and insight is perception and profound depth of understanding human beings, human nature and reality. So this is called the haq, 
the absolute and the ultimate holistic truth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates with. So here we see that the Quran addresses human beings with this vision that you will do things here in this world, but the effect of what you do will be everlasting. And you will see that in the other world, if you don't have a plan to help people survive and thrive in the other world, then you are limited in your ability to lead. Right. Now the Quran says about the Romans. يَعْلَمُونَ ظَاهِرًا مِنَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَهُمْ عَنِ الْآخِرَاتِ هُمْ That they know the apparent of what's in this world. ظاهر. What is apparent and obvious within the next 50 years, 100 years, they know. Meaning as governments, as visionaries, as political geniuses, they know. يعلمون, they know. ظاهراً من الحياة الدنيا What is going to happen in their time, in their term, and how they forecast, and how they then plan and then develop, and they come into treaties with other people, and they make this trade, and that trade, and this policy, and that policy. They know how to play that game very well. But then the Quran says, وَهُمْ عَنِ الْآخِرَاتِ هُمْ But they, concerning the Akhirah, they are totally in oblivion. They are oblivious of what's going to happen to them and to others, their subjects, their citizens, in the Akhirah. So the Quran now says, you need a holistic, now visionary, you don't need a partial vision. That is why Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, their leadership was holistic. Because their purpose was not just to establish good government on earth, where there was justice, and there was now the ability of every Muslim to perform the duties and the rights of Islam freely. Their focus was also on that nobody should be deprived of salvation in the akhir. That was their vision. Nowadays, we've given these ideals certain terms. What is that term? What's the term for this? Fundamentalism. Islamicism. And what have you. What do Muslims call this? Conservatism. Mullahism. So, whether it's a Muslim or non-Muslim, if you, if you do, you do, you're damned, and if you don't do, you're damned. Neki koro, guna lazim. You do a good deed, people will condemn you as sinners. The Quran is saying, Baba, look, it is necessary that as people who know what's going to happen to you in the Akhirah, that you show a little bit of this vision of what's going to happen to the Ummah in this dunya also. Right? That's the problem. Those who say that Muslims must do everything for the Akhirah, they also need to do what? Make sure that they have a plan for this dunya. So it's both long term and short term. You need long term vision and you need short term vision. If you are deprived of any one of those two, you're not a visionary. Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam took his uh, wife and children to the empty desert of Bakka and left them and he envisioned what? What's happening today in Bakka? He envisioned this. How many millennials ago? Allahu Akbar. Burzukhum min al Ibrahim says, makes the dua. Allah grant them of fruit Fruit in a desert. Give me a break. So Allah give them fruit. How is fruit going to go come to a desert? He wasn't asking Allah. Allah make Makkah an oasis. Where they can grow their own palm trees and date trees and orchards and this and that. He didn't say that. Allah grants them fruits. 
fruits will come from where? From outside. He didn't say change the terrain of Makkah instead of being a desert because of an oil. He didn't say because of an Now, until now, mashallah, the fruits you find there, you don't find here. When you go for Hajj Umrah, we are still benefiting from the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. We're eating the fruits of his dua. وَرْزُقْهُمْ مِنَ الثَّبَرَاتِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَشْكُرُونَ So that they may be grateful for what you are able to provide for them in this dunya. But that was short-term planning. Long-term planning. Allah saved the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and so on. So it's both, both. That you need knowledge of ظَاهِرًا مِنَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا The Qur'an acknowledges, yes, these people who rule the world, they do so because they know the ظَاهِر, the apparent of this dunya. But if you want to be a Muslim ruler, and you want to be as successful as Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, then you must also know something about the Akhirah. That in your government, you will not do anything that's going to jeopardize any Muslim's ability to procure salvation on the day of death. It's both. How do you coincide the two? Reconcile? That's called your knowledge of the Quran. Where you're able to do this and that. And then, the proof, my dear brothers and sisters, is in the pudding. Historically. Right. Muslims were well to do and they were living very well even as Ali and Muawiyah were fighting. They were all middle class citizens by then. Everybody was a middle class citizen. So that's the dahir of the dunya. Right? They had that. You know, if you go to the remains of Muslim Spain, you will see subhanAllah, mind boggling culture. In their architecture, their design, their hygiene, everything. If you go to other places in the Muslim world, you'll see that how were they so great, subhanAllah. So the Muslim rulers had the dunya in mind also. They did not discard the dunya, except they gave preference to one thing, and that's the akhirah, over the dunya. So they made sure that Muslims were able to practice Islam freely within Darul Islam without being contaminated with other ideologies and so on. The free society where you are free to practice Islam. At the same time, you had something of the dunya also where uh, people from other civilizations would migrate to Spain and to North Africa and they would go all the way to India to, to, to do what? Middle East and uh, to enjoy life in this dunya. That is historical fact. So you need both. So this uh, sequence of ayat tell us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, informing Muslims that when you read world events, one is that world events will be contextual to the world and the other is that world events are to be measured against what might happen in the other world. So you're reading a holistic now interpretation of what's happening with human beings. And that's how you study history through the Muslim lens. أَوَلَمْ يَتَفَكَّرُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ مَا خَلَقُ اللَّهُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضُ مَا بَيْنُهُمَا إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ وَأَجَلِ مُسَمَّعًا Here the Quran then says, do they not reflect in their own selves that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the heavens and the earth and whatever is in between the two with only the truth. إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ With the haq, and the haq is not divisible. You cannot divide the haq into what happens in this dunya and what happens in the akhirah, or what may have happened, uh, or what you might have seen in the world of uh, the metaphysical realm, or the world of images and dreams. And so, on. so that's all part of the whole truth. And then, so Allah creates the heavens and the earth with the whole truth, not just a partial truth. So he gave knowledge to the prophets, alayhi wasalam, that when you teach your people, then you must teach them the whole truth, not just the partial truth. And this is when you reflect in yourself, you will see this in you. So here the Quran is uh, encouraging 
human beings to think and ponder from two vantage points, two platforms. One is the afaq, what's outside of them, what they can observe through the physical eye and the brain. And the other is the anfus themselves, what they may observe through the inner eye, their heart. So here the Quran says that if you understand the holistic truth of what happens outside of you, then observe what happens inside of you. Fian fusi. The fian fusi is another place in the Quran. Yeah? Within yourselves, think and contemplate uh, within yourselves that this is happening in you. So if this is happening in you, that is closer to the truth than what's happening outside of you. So what's happening in you? What happens in you? What happens in you is that you change every day. You have mood swings every hour. You have different desires and thoughts every hour. You have now different needs different times of the day. And you have different needs based on seasons. And you have different needs based on your age. And you have different needs based on your relationships with people with different people. So everything that's inside of you is governed by change. And you will adapt according to what's required of you and from you. And your body adapts to, to the weather changes and the climate and all of that. And to your own age. Right? So everything, within, if you think about what happens in you, psychologically and physically and even medically, then you will see that you are a complete cosmos within yourself. That within you, you can find many applications of what, what's happening in the cosmos and that is governed by one factor and that is called change. You change. So everything outside of you changes and you change and that is the haq, the total truth. So likewise, when you die, you will change. Are you ready for that change? Are you ready to acclimatize for death and after death? That is the whole truth which is the message of all prophets alayhi wa salam number one. وَأَجَلِ Musamma And then there's a, there's a limited term. There's a fixed term with which Allah has created. The life of the heavens and the earth and your lives. So your lives will terminate when you die. The heavens and the earth, they will cease to exist when Allah says they will cease to exist on the day of judgment. So you are, you are a reflection of the cosmos and the cosmos is a reflection of you. They are intertwined, they are interdependent and they are interrelated. وَإِنَّ كَثِيرًا مِّنَ النَّاسِ بِلِقَاءِ رَبِّهِمْ كَافِرُونَ And that is why the next statement is a logical conclusion. Of that. Since many people deny their meeting their Lord. This is a factual statement after the fact. It's a conclusion. So when you do not observe this way, that you will die and the universe will also die, then uh, you are denying that you're going to meet Allah, your Lord. It's a factual statement. So many people, they are in denial of meeting their Lord. So it's because you don't want to meet your Lord, or you don't believe there is a Lord, and if there is a Lord, you don't believe that, you are going to meet Him. Uh, maybe sometimes under unpleasant circumstances, you deny the total truth, of your own existence in the world. No. I only have this life. And I have no other life after this life. So you prepare for this life. And you don't prepare for that life. And you deny your meeting with Allah. On the other side. Then the Quran. Encourages us. Again further. To think more about what happens in human history. Mm. أَوَلَمْ يَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَيَنْظُرُوا كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبَةُ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ Have they not traveled the earth and have they not so that they could observe and think and contemplate about how the fate of those before him came to an end. كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبَةُ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ So now the Quran is saying you know history, you have read history, go and see and observe their remnants and their relics and see where they are today and how great they used to be. They are much more severe in power than they are. Meaning people before you, 
were far more stronger and mightier than you are. وَأَثَارُوا الْأَرْضُ وَعَمَرُوهَا And then they dug the earth and they lived, made dwellings on the earth and they inhabited the earth أَكْثَرَ مِمَّا عَمَرُوهَا Much more than you of today are inhabiting the earth. Referring to the Quraysh here specifically that people before you lived better than you lived. People before you had more power than you had. And people before you were far richer than you are. This is how the Quran now depicts the lesson from history. That if you want to study human history and civilizations, then you must do so. But the only conclusion you can draw scientifically is that they're dead. Can you disagree with that? No. And looking from their relics and their architecture and everything, can you say that they had a bad life? That they were poor people? No. That's the conclusion you can draw. Right? You go to the Great Pyramids. That is Allah. How did they live in this filthy, rich environment? With all the gold and all the treasures. And... But where are they? They're dead. Right? Were they richer than you? You better believe it. So did they have a better life than you? Well, you better believe it. But where are they? They're dead. Do you know what happened to them in their grave? No. That's the question you should ask. So next time you go visit some of these sacred sites of the world, the conclusion you must draw is that they're dead. Not that they were great. They were great, but then they died. Finished khalas. Enjoy the moment. I'm not saying don't enjoy the pyramid. Enjoy the moment. But come back to earth, literally. Afterwards, make salat of tawbah. Make salat of haja. Read some Quran, dua, and zikr, and say, Allah, I'm going to be like them. But I want you to meet me in a pleasant way, not in an unpleasant way. وَجَاءَتْهُمْ رُسُلُهُمْ بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ At the same time as they were living this luxurious lifestyle, enjoying the lucrative prosperity that they had in their days, at the same time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not leave them alone. وَجَاءَتْهُمْ رُسُلُهُمْ بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ Their messengers came to them with very strong evidences, very open and clear and obvious evidences of Allah's existence. And the Prophet's being a prophet, and the fact that the Akhirah is a reality. So Allah warned them, Allah sent the messengers so that they would not leave the world destitute. That is Allah's fadl on people, Allah's rahmah on people, that He would send messengers to warn people that uh, they may enjoy the dunya, but not at the expense of being cursed in the Akhirah, and not being spared. So they should live their lives in a very just way, in a very noble way, enjoy the bounties and the gifts Allah has provided them. At the same time, worship Allah and follow the message. فَمَا كَانُ اللَّهُ لِيَظْلِمَهُمْ وَلَكِنْ كَانُوا أَنفُسًا يَظْلِمُونَ So Allah was not about to cause any in, in, injustice upon them. He did not inflict any injustice upon them, but rather they themselves inflicted an injustice upon themselves. So they were unjust and then their fate was then sealed because of their injustice. Bun. So here we see the opening passage of uh, Surah Al-Rum. One more ayah after that. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing human beings as individuals and human beings as civilizations. That as a civilization... Later on in the surah, Allah will address human beings as a total whole. From Adam until the day of judgment. You see that at the end of the surah. Anyway, here as civilizations, you must appreciate that in order for you to be successful as a, a government and a civilization, is that you must have people who can forecast what's going to happen in this world. At the same time, you need uh, people who can help you uh, understand what's going to happen to you after death. Oh, yeah. oh, number one. Number two, if the people now only want the dunya, then you must remind them of what the Quran calls Ayyamullah. Hmm. 
the days of Allah or the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala operates in human history. Warn them that this is going to happen. Just as if you are, unfortunately, God forbid, Allah keep us all, you're a diabetic or you're this type of patient. Then your doctor will warn you this is going to happen. Yeah, and that is very scientific. And we take the doctor's word, mashallah, as gospel, which is good. You should. <laughs> That's fine. It's no problem. Then. Keep yourself alive as much as possible. Likewise, the doctors of the prophethood who came through prophethood and with wahi, they have forecasted that if you have diabetes as a civilization, you should do this, this and that. You have to cut back on your sugar, on your sweets. Stop living a life of luxury. That's your diabetes. Otherwise you'll need insulin. <laughs> You'll have a miserable fate if you don't. What is that fate? You'll die as a civilization. Right? Who knows that? Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, Ali. Why do they know that? Because they came from the Prophet ﷺ. They were trained by him and they learned from him. So they knew that the glory in this dunya will be short-lived. And your purpose of government must be to ensure that every citizen, every member of your community is able to live peacefully without dhulm and in freedom so that they can practice the sharia in a way that salvation will be procured inshallah through Allah's follow. Likewise today, Muslim communities, when they are promoting and preaching khilafah, they must have both in mind that we need aman, okay, which is the basis for what? Freedom of religion. In a Muslim country, if you're not free to practice the Sharia, your Salat, your Salam, Zakat, and Hajj, and whatever rules that you want to initiate through Islamic law, whatever, then that is not Aman, that is the Fasad, that is commotion and corruption. So people must ensure that you have an infrastructure that not only promotes but guarantees security that your schools will open on time, you will have colleges, universities, your hospitals will be there, income will be there, education will be there, and hygiene will be there. That is called Aman. At the same time, the purpose of this is to make sure Muslims understand value the Akhirah, that you're not here forever. You go to the relics of South Russia, mashallah, South Russia, where Imam Bukhari and other great scholars were, Uzbe- Uzbekistan and others. You go there, and now there's a revival, but uh, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, they were used as museums, and sometimes the massage were used as stables for horses. You understand? The massage were used as stables for horses, about 50 years ago. Right. What does that tell you? It's called Ayyamullah. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alternates history in life. History of civilizations is a theme in the Quran. And if you learn this, this is what Surah Al-Rum is about. This is how you must understand the world that if you don't do this, you will suffer from civilizational diabetes and you'll have too much luxury and then you'll suffer and you'll die. And whatever you leave behind of your great culture will be seen as the past and not as something for the future. It is the Akhirah. You must focus on as individuals and perhaps even sometimes as a government. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this was dhulm which they enforced upon themselves. Injustice that they brought upon themselves, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not unjust. He leaves the, the, the affairs of the dunya to the laws of the dunya. He will change that law because you are a great superpower or whatever. Right. Whether you're Muslim or other Muslim, it doesn't matter. If you are Muslim, then there's recourse, tawbah, there's istighfar, and there's isra, and there's nasiha, and there's this and that. If you are non-Muslim, then your recourse is iman, and your recourse is to uh, not commit any injustice against anybody. So here the Quran is saying that they were destroyed because of their own injustice upon themselves. وَلَكِنْ كَانُوا أَنفُسُهُمْ يظلمون. They were the, themselves unjust towards themselves, meaning they were tyrants and those people who had great wealth and power. 
like the Qawmi Ad and the Qawmi Tamud and the Qawmi Fir'aun, they were extremely unjust to their people. They were tyrants and they were dictators and they monopolized everything that they thought they owned. They did not look towards the poor and they uh, they became disenfranchised and obviously that's history. So likewise in any worldly civilization if the idea of uh, justice is promoted and there is equal opportunity for people to do what needs to be done in terms of living in this world then that civilization will run. So as soon as uh, you start dividing people and you say we don't care about the 98% we only care about the 2% then you have a problem. You will crumble from within. You will be corroded from within. Then yeah, obviously nobody will have health insurance. <laughs> and you will have poor people. Oh. South side and north side of Chicago. And you will have people in Chicago. And New York and LA begging on the streets, on the highways. And so on. That's not just... Something has to be done about that. That is not equal opportunity for every citizen. That is something else. Anyway, that's some of the issues with injustice today. It's also injustice. So those people who want to make a change for life in this world, they're on the right track. Except for the Muslim, we must also have another value, and that is the Akhir. How am I going to meet my Lord on the Day of Judgment if I do, don't do my Salat, if I don't fast, if I don't give my Zakat, if I don't think about going for Hajj and helping others in the world, and so on. This is another added component for the Muslim. So the Muslim does not compromise with justice. He adds value to justice. The Muslim does not compromise with justice. He adds value to the theory of justice, whatever that theory is today in the world. ثُمَّ كَانَ عَقِبَةَ الَّذِينَ أَسَاءُوا and كَذَّبُوا بِآيَةِ اللَّهِ وَكَانُوا بِهَا يَسْتَهْزِئُونَ And then look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that look at the eventual fate of those who were promoting evil. أَسَاءُوا أَسُوءَ That they were very evil in their evil. Meaning that they did not believe Allah exists or Allah will do anything to them. What was their evil? That they denied and rejected the signs of the proofs of God. And كَذَّبُوا بِآيَةِ اللَّهِ That is also evil. That you deny the existence of God and you, exi- you deny that Allah subhanahu is in control of you and your life. That is also evil. Su'a. Very evil. وَكَانُوا بِهَا يَسَّزِيُونَ And more than that, they would mock at them. They would make fun of them. And they would ridicule them. And they would draw cartoons. That's also evil. Meaning Allah is saying, that when they meet Allah, this is what's going to happen to him. Allah will not be very happy at all with them when he meets them. That they think they can get away with whatever they think they can get away with. So in this world, they may get away with it under the freedom of expression rule, but on the day of judgment, they will not get away with it. This is the aqibah. Okay. The eventual fate, Allah is saying to people in this world, that in this world, justice will never be served with the haq, with the absolute truth. People may get away with murder, as we know, right? Through the justice system, on technicalities, under so-called due process laws and what not technicalities, this and that, right? or uh, circumstantial evidence, or not enough evidence, and so on. So Allah subhanahu is saying, yes, we must promote justice in this world, but you must leave a very big gate open for ultimate justice to be served where? In the earth. If you don't leave that in your mind open, then you'll become very narrow-minded and you'll be thinking very violently about things. And you'll end up committing another form of injustice which is called vigilantism. That's also injustice. Then you're not following the rule. The whole point about justice is that you must follow the rule. Law and order. In a civil society, you are civilized because you are civil. Right? If you become uncivil, 
and you are now not following the laws, then you are uncivilized in that sense. The Sharia also has a due process. Sharia has ways to uh, find evidence and to to, to uh, prove points. And it is a due process, as I said. And there are ways to uh, accept and reject testimony and proof and so on. But it's, it's through the due process. If that is not maintained, then there is injustice, even though a person who is guilty may go free. The Prophet ﷺ said to the Sahaba after a case that it might be that sometimes one of you comes to me with a case in front of your brother and because of his ability to articulate his case, I may decide in favor of him. But if he knows that I have decided in favor of him only because of his ability to represent himself, then I have decreed for him a fire, a piece of coal from the fire of hell. Meaning, that is quite possible even with an Islamic system that the ultimate justice is not served even though you followed the process. As the Prophet ﷺ warned the Sahaba and warned Muslims through them that you may be victorious in court but if you know in your heart you were lying Ah, then you have another day to reckon with. That's called the day of judgment. Okay? So here, the ideal in the mind of a Muslim is that justice must be served. But, as I said, leave this big gate open for the ultimate justice to be served where? There, not here. Okay? You may not get to the whole truth in this world. And sometimes the truth may be covered or disguised. And sometimes the truth may be totally misunderstood that as long as you follow the process you are now not guilty of injustice you will be guilty of nothing else except not knowing you know, the facts for that Allah will forgive you and spare you but Allah may not spare that person who was guilty of concealing the truth and you know, violating the rights of other people and then Allah will take you to task and كَذَّبُوا بِآيَةِ اللَّهِ وَكَانُوا بِهَا يَسْتَحْزِئُونَ But then uh, they would make mockery of Allah's ayat and signs. This is another way to make mockery. And that is to say that you are now innocent when you are guilty. That's also a mockery. It's a mockery of the system. It's a mockery of the people around you. It's a mockery of the people that whom you may have violated. Istihza it comes in many ways and forms. Not just verbal and uh, not just civilization, it may be very legal. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is warning uh, everybody that as you're reading the world and the events of the world and you want to judge now certain communities, civilizations and governments that they are just or unjust, then you may want to consider the whole truth which is very difficult to establish on this earth. You will not get that ideal ever on this earth because this earth is restricted by time and space and restricted by a very fixed term of life and existence and the ultimate truth will become visible on the day when it will become visible for that you must prepare morally also that as a moral human being meaning I believe in Allah I believe in the day of judgment so I must make sure that I am sincere in whatever it is I do and we make dua for that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshaAllah, give us the ability to follow what pleases Allah the most in this world and also in the world hereafter, inshaAllah. Jazakumullah khair. We will stop here today. Yeah. I have a, a commitment to attend, inshaAllah, and janaz and so We make dua for the deceased also. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, subhanallah, alhamdulillah.